the science and worrying about what may have happened with the science from Ian and how that may have had problems with the international body that looks after it. But where the real seriousness comes in is that all this has been leading to policy, of course, on economics, energy, and all sorts of issues. Right. Um, now, unless you are going to sleep for the last 24 hours, you will have heard uh, the autumn statement and just how horrendous our economic uh, situation is. I must admit, uh, I, I, when I saw the new OBR forecast, the Office for Budget Responsibility forecasts, it was pretty uh, gripping stuff. And that it was assuming that the Eurozone would somehow resolve in a satisfactory sort of way. Well, that's pretty big proviso. I think really what it did point to the fact was that we've got economic difficulties. Boy, have we got economic difficulties. But when it comes to the Climate Change Act and the Renewables Directive, which I'll talk about as well, uh, energy costs, I do think we've something of an own goal here because there's absolutely no doubt that these two pieces of legislation are pushing up our energy costs, as I trust this handout will show. There are, of course, I, I know today is basically about the Climate Change Act, but when you are looking at uh, energy policies, you have to consider the Renewables Directive at the same time. It's the interaction, it's the combination of these two splendid pieces of legislation that are causing us such difficulties. And of course, as we know, the Climate Change Act uh, in 2008, and I remember it well, it was discussed in this house, I think, when we had snow in October, uh, as I sarcastically commented on some blog. But uh, it was all about cutting uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050 uh, by 80% uh, compared with the 1990 level. And uh, as you see on the table one, uh, there are certain carbon budgets and it's, this is going to be done in stages so that uh, for the period 2008 to 2012, uh, which uh, actually is, uh, co co coincides with the Kyoto first commitment period, we're meant to have our uh, greenhouse gas emissions down 22% compared with 1990. And then one budget after another, there's another squeeze on, on these emissions until we meet this holy grail of almost entirely decarbonizing the economy. Um, by the way, it's interesting to note that there we are talking about 34% uh, uh, emissions cuts by uh, 2018 to 2022. Um, the EU, and sometimes I don't always speak approvingly of that wonderful <coughs> organisation, uh, but it actually goes for less draconian uh, cuts than we've got. Um, it actually goes for just 20%, just 20% she, she casually uh, mm -hmm. by 1990. But as I say, it's not just the Climate Change Act that's a problem for energy and therefore for business, it's also the Renewables Directive. And here, uh, Britain is committed, and this is Tony Blair, against advice from his, uh, uh, his officials, by the way, that he committed us to sourcing our final energy consumption, 15% of that final energy consumption, from renewable sources uh, by 2020. And renewables, of course, they include wind and hydro and biomass, but they don't include nuclear power. Now, as you see from chart one, in this rather fetching mauve colour, um, this means that, that uh, this commitment on our behalf means that we've got quite the biggest challenge uh, to meet this target of the EU, uh, of the big EU countries. I think Malta may technically be in a more difficult situation, but Malta isn't a particularly big country, as we all know. But that tells you that back in 2005, just 1.3% of our final electricity consumption came from renewables. We're meant to be getting to 15% by 2020, which means an increase in share of 13.7%. Whereas if a country like Poland, it's just 7.8%. So we've yet again, you know, here we are, we're over-egging the carbon dioxide targets, even in comparison with EU, but we're also doing that with the renewables targets. Caught about a double masochism, I do not know. But one of the implications of this is that we have uh, all committed ourselves to increasing uh, electricity generated from renewables uh, from about 5.5%, 6% in 2009 um, to about 30% in 2020. And it's that uh, dynamic that's pushing, of course, the great move to wind power. 
if we would not got the renewables directive but just had the carbon dioxide, uh, the Climate Change Act, then there wouldn't necessarily be that emphasis on wind power. Yeah, I'm afraid to say it's the renewable stuff that is driving the wind power with, uh, I think, fairly disastrous uh, consequences uh, for costs, as I'll come on to. Now, turning the page to chart two, um, Philip has already mentioned uh, what a paltry carbon emitter we are. Uh, I will never use the word carbon polluter, by the way. I think it's an outrageous bit of distortion of the language. Um, there we are. I, I, put us, I put ourselves in, in uh, shining yellow. Uh, our share in 2009, according to the International Energy Agency, uh, was 1.6% actually. And yes, Ian, just to say that Australia's is one and a half. So Australia was uh, 13th on the list of 18 big emitters. We were 10. Uh, tenth. But of course, and again, as Philip was implying, there's China, 23% of total emissions, unrising quickly, by the way. Um, the United States are, um, is, is now 17 to 18%. But the EU as a whole, then this is, I think, an interesting statistic, is only about 11 or 12%. I think, as I, I noticed, uh, that some spokesman from the EU was actually saying yesterday, because of course, again, as Philip has uh, suggested the Durban conference is going on at the moment. As I understand, there are no expectations of any commitments uh, beyond 2012. Um, and the EU is, even the EU is beginning to question whether their carbon dioxide uh, cut uh, reductions targets are sensible in a world where nobody else, uh, except for possibly Australia, is actually prepared to play ball. China is not going to play ball and cut its carbon emissions to restrict its economic growth. Neither is the United States of America, by the way, even though there are some people in that country who would like to. And of course there are, I think there is legislation in certain states, but we're talking about national uh, commitments. India, no thank you. Russia, no thank you. Japan, no thank you. And Canada, no thank you. And I suspect Iran wouldn't be too persuasive, too easily persuaded on these matters either. Uh, seeing what's been happening to our, our, uh, our, our embassy in the last couple of days. So even <laughs> the real question to me is there at Durban, I, th I think these shows are frankly absurd, but the notion that we, UK, the great leader in this fight towards saving the planet, should be listened to by all these uh, fast developing economies, I think is farcical. We're a tiny player, a minuscule player in this particular debate in many ways, and even the EU, bless it, uh, is, is not so differently placed. This, to me, is just an absurd situation, but uh, let's see what comes out of Durban. I suspect not very much. Chart 3, very quickly, just shows you uh, from 1990 to 2009 just how the various uh, carbon emissions have, have changed for various countries. Uh, as you see, uh, China's have gone up uh, 200%. Uh, ours have actually fallen back, uh, or at least ours have fallen back about 15 or 16%. But look at Indonesia, look at uh, Saudi Arabia, look at India, look at Iran. These are countries that want to grow, and I fully understand why they do. They want to have reasonable living standards, and they're going to use fossil fuels in order to get there. So now, moving on from the international uh, to uh, the more homespun information as to just how our legislation uh, affects um, uh, electricity prices. And but electricity prices I'm concentrating on, a, it's quite a large source of uh, carbon dioxide emissions, and of course, electricity is such a big uh, cost uh, for some businesses, and that's why it's interesting to look at electricity prices. And here, I've taken some figures for, um, from a business called Mott McDonald. Mott McDonald is a, an engineering consultancy. And it was commissioned by DEC, the Department for Energy and Climate Change, to actually put some calculations together. So in fact, these figures are not just plucked out of thin airs, but they are actually the figures that were commissioned by the Department of Energy and Climate Change. That is why I think they're so important to look at. And it's interesting that Mott MacDonald uh, looked at the costs of various different types of generating electricity. 
And as you see in this charts, 4A and 4B, and these are just two of their, six, uh, their ten cases. They have ten cases. If anybody actually wants to look at the whole report, do so, because it's a very interesting report indeed. But I just picked two out. One is a near-term project, and one is more a medium-term project. But looking at the, the near-term project to start with, that's uh, chart 4A, then you can see um, in glorious technical of red, those are the total costs of generating electricity uh, pounds per megawatt hour for gas, that's a combined cycle gas to turbine, I hope. Uh, CCS, of course, stands for carbon capture and storage, another great fantasy. Uh, ASC uh, stands for advanced supercritical coal, and please don't ask me how these things work, I'm not an engineer. Um, but then I, you get on to the delights of onshore wind and offshore wind and nuclear uh, pressurised water reactors there. And you can see that in uh, chart 4A, the cheapest way of generating electricity is, guess what, is coal. But then, of course, we have something called carbon costs, and these are the costs that come through from the EU's emissions trading system, and from 2013, also, there's something called the carbon floor price, which will massively push up these carbon costs. And having done that, it means the coal becomes less competitive. You know, this, this, is, this is the way we sort of push coal out of the show because it becomes so inordinately expensive at once all the carbon costs have been allowed for. And then, really, what happens then is, so if you look at table 2A, uh, I, I, I sort of put everything in, I rank them in order. So excluding carbon costs, you know, coal was the cheapest. By the way, the most expensive was offshore wind. Um, and you'll note that offshore wind actually takes bottom place in quite a lot of these particular charts. It's extraordinary. But including the carbon costs, uh, then coal becomes the fourth most expensive. Um, but in addition to that, of course, these Mott MacDonald figures and such a lot of the estimates that look at uh, electricity generating costs <coughs> exclude the fact that wind power is a very unreliable source indeed. And of course, it is often said that, oh, don't worry, you know, there's, wind is always blowing somewhere in the British Isles because we're a windy country. But if you actually look at chart five, and I thought this was fascinating, not least of all because I found it on the BBC website, and I love quoting the BBC. And I'm sure you remember, I mean, 21st of December last year, perhaps that's when you were here, Liam, because you said you were over in December, but I remember how viciously cold it was that day. And the wind did hardly stir, even in the Outer Hebrides, apparently. And uh, it, this, this article on the BBC website, had no sense of irony, there's just no sense of irony from these people at all. It was going about, coal takes the strain again. Because of course the fact was there was hardly any wind generated electricity at all. You know, 20 megawatts out of a total of about 57,000 megawatts for the 21st of December. It was bitterly cold, no wind. Uh, demand was very high, and uh, so of course what happened to ha all these poor old coal stations had to be put back on stream, otherwise the lights would have gone out, and that is the problem with wind. Uh, but to be, to be generous to wind, the wind does blow some of the time, uh, but it was, I wanted to put back in chart 4A and 4B again, uh, some estimate of what the costs of, of having this conventional standby generation would be. And what I did was I, I looked at a, a report by Parsons Brinkerhoff, which is another of the um, engineering consultancies, <coughs> and they produced a report for the Royal Academy of Engineering, and they suggested that the standby costs for onshore wind uh, should be about 45% of costs, and the offshore wind should be about 30% of costs. So I've made allowance for that. And that's the sort of the yellow uh, bit of the graph. And then, last but not least, um, as it's been pointed out to me by various engineers, because what is so fascinating about getting into this subject is that engineers begin to talk to you. And uh, the trouble is, most of, I, I don't understand most of which they say, because it's so incredibly technical. But another problem with wind is that you need a, a lot of reinforcement of the transmission system. And I have got a figure from Colin Gibson, who is well known in this area, who uh, worked for the National Grid Group, he was the Power Network Director, and he suggested another 20 to 30 uh, pounds per megawatt hour of costs for wind. 
and I've just added on 20, 20 pounds per megawatt hour there. But again, you can see, by the time you've finished, to cut a very long story short, once you've allowed for all the carbon costs, and once you've allowed for all the extra costs because of wind, which we are we're being driven by the Renewables Directive to, to, to push ahead with, it just means our whole energy costs become incredibly distorted and incredibly expensive, needlessly expensive. And then moving swiftly on, um, I say, well, table charts 4B and table 2B, they just look at a, a medium term uh, project of 2017. You'll see the figures change a little, uh, but the overall moral of the tale uh, doesn't change that much. Uh, but what comes out of it, of course, is that nuclear power indeed becomes, once you allow for the carbon costs in particular, it becomes uh, one of the most viable technologies and the, most, the, and the least expensive. Now, um, say moving swiftly on, we know already that our so-called green policies have added to uh, electricity <coughs> prices. And way back in 2008, um, when there was a department called BUR, which was I think the Business and Energy and Regulatory Reform Department, um, what a charming title that was, already these green policies were adding 14% uh, to domestic bills and 21% to business bills. And then in, in 2009, the government, as it was of the day, estimated that those figures would rise quite considerably by 2020. You know, they were talking about 18%, perhaps even up to 33% for domestic, and possibly up to 70% for business. Um, to me, <laughs> crazy. Not merely on the domestic bills is this highly regressive, but of course, look what you're doing to business costs. You're just pushing business costs up all the time. Since then, uh, the Department of Energy and Climate Change has come up with some more estimates, and I put those into table four. And in fact, these estimates were hot of the press, I think, last week. And they, they estimate them for three different cases, whether they're low fuel prices or the medium-sized fossil fuel prices or the high fossil fuel prices. It, the, the, the estimates are quite sensitive, obviously, to fuel prices. But just taking the central case, um, they are essentially saying that um, these are changes to prices, by the way, not bills, that domestic prices, household prices, could be up by 27% in 2020. They could be up 34% for medium-sized businesses by 2020. <coughs> they could be up by 8 to 28% for large energy-intensive energy users. And this is really what I mean by an own goal, when we're actually wanting to stimulate the economy and get some growth into it. We are actually putting extra costs onto business. Now, I'm aware that in the autumn statement yesterday, uh, there is going to be some help for the heavy energy users. That's uh, steel and, uh, and chemicals, for example. I think it's going to be from 2013 when the carbon floor price kicks in. But whether that offsets all the extra costs, I personally don't know as yet. But the problem is, the message still goes across to industrialists that we're a high energy cost country, and therefore this isn't a very good place to be doing these sorts of things and manufacturing these sorts of things. It's still a real no-no. Uh, added to which there's the irony that where does this extra 250 million come from by the end of the parliament? It comes from the poor or beleaguered taxpayer. So what do you do? You bring in these policies, you slam up energy costs, and then you subsidise them. But forgive me if I say this, this doesn't seem a terribly well thought through policy. And this is a time when we are told that the economy has to start swinging away from financial services, we all meant to go boo because it's to do with things like bankers, towards the manufacturing sector, and on the whole I suspect manufacturing, whatever it is, whether it's particularly energy intensive fusing or not, it tends to use more energy than perhaps the financial services do. Um, it doesn't quite hold together. And what I do feel very strongly is, why are we doing this to ourselves? It is masochism. Yes, it's a masochism for Australia too. And it may be a little bit of masochism there in the EU. But we in particular, because we want to be the great leader, we are the ones that are actually imposing the worst costs upon ourselves. You will not be surprised to hear, I think, the Climate Change Act should be repealed. 
And you'll be not, su not surprised to hear that I also think renewable stuff should be either repealed or reneged on. But I know that's a whole different world. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ruth. And that, of course, hits at the heart, really, of what we're talking about uh, today. If I were asked myself what has been one of the biggest political failures over the last 20 years, it has been the failure to foresee the energy gap that was coming. And then, because we've been constrained by the EU policies and by the global warming agenda, to fail to really address that quickly now, so that in Britain we are so far behind and facing a very, very serious energy gap indeed. My own view is that there will be no choices in the future, and that's going to be very interesting to see how the politicians deal with the issue of having to reintroduce coal and all sorts of other factors that I think personally are absolutely inevitable. So we turn to energy <coughs> with Dr Ridley now, and very, very important Matt, as you all know, I would say, <laughs> he might blush, is our finest popular science writer and has done a tremendous job recently in talking about the problems of energy and particularly renewables and the alternatives as a columnist in the Times and, of course, through his marvellous book, The Rational Optimist. And if there were one book I would recommend everybody in this room read if they haven't read it, it's that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Philip, very much indeed. Um, the the Climate Change Act, and indeed our policy generally, is predicated on the assumption that we've got to give up using fossil fuels in the next few decades, either because the carbon dioxide is going to damage uh, the planet badly enough that we need to stop using them for that reason, or because they're going to run out. Well, we've heard a bit about the first argument uh, and how essentially what we're doing is putting an economic tourniquet around our neck to stop a nosebleed. In other words, that the cure is far worse than the disease. But I want to talk about the, the second uh, issue, the, the question of whether or not fossil fuels are going to run out in the near term, whether we have to worry about running out of gas, oil and coal uh, in the next few decades. We've been here before. Gladstone made a speech in the House of Commons in the 1860s promising to pay down the debt of this country while the coal lasted, because it wasn't going to last very long. Uh, President Harding of the United States commissioned a report which came back to him in 1922 saying that gas production had already peaked and was already on the wane. Uh, M. King Hubbard, the uh, champion of uh, peak oil, said in 1956 that gas production would peak around 1970 and fall thereafter. Uh, Jimmy Carter in 1970s said that uh, the oil was going to run out with, by the end of the next decade. Uh, gas was expected to be the first of the fossil fuels to run out until just a few years ago. In fact, we now know for sure that there are at least 1,300 years' worth of fossil fuels in the crust of the Earth at current rates of use. Now, a lot of that is not going to be accessible. A lot of it consists of methane clathrates on the ocean floor, hydrated methane, which the Japanese and the Chinese are trying to work out how to turn into a fuel, but they may not succeed. It may never be possible to do that at an economic rate. But an awful lot of the rest is accessible. And a lot of it just got a whole lot more accessible, so that the International Energy Agency said earlier this year that it reckoned there is 250 years' worth of gas uh, available to us at reasonable prices. The situation has been utterly transformed in the energy scene uh, in the last five years by the discovery of how to extract shale gas from shale. Gas is now a fuel that is abundant, ubiquitous, that is to say, you can find it in every country uh, and you can find it close to markets, uh, which is key, so it can be affordable, uh, cheap, uh, clean, environmentally friendly, and of course, low carbon. I'll come back to that. This all goes back to a chap called George Mitchell in Texas in the 1990s who uh, decided that instead of waiting for gas to seep out of shale and into sandstone, let's go and get the gas where it lives in the shale but how do we get it out of there? Shale is too tight, you have to fracture it. Uh, he eventually worked out in the Barnet Shale in, in Texas how to do it, and by the early 2000s, the Barnet Shale was uh, suddenly producing enormous amounts of gas. Um, by 2007, it was announced that uh, um, a company had worked out how to do this in the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, uh, which turns out to be, as a result of this discovery, the largest uh, gas discovery in the world, bar the one of Qatar, and bigger than any oil field ever found, including those in Saudi Arabia, in terms of its energy content. 
When I was writing about this earlier this year, um, I was looking around the world and seeing that the, the, there are promising shale in Poland, lots in China, plenty in South Africa, South America, other places. But at the time, Brit Britain didn't look that promising. There was excitement talk about uh, doing something near Blackpool, but it might be a few trillion cubic feet, maybe 10 if we were lucky. Um, just as a comparison, the Marcellus shale is estimated at 500 trillion cubic feet. Well, we now know there's 200 trillion cubic feet under Lancashire, or thereabouts, we don't know for sure, but it looks like it is a field almost half the size of that gigantic one in the United States. The economic benefits of shale gas are considerable. They have resulted in the decoupling of the oil price and the gas price in North America. You can see it on a graph. Uh, Mer American and British gas prices track each other closely over the last uh, uh, couple of decades until just three or four years ago when ours shoots up in the last three years, America stays low. Um, American gas prices are roughly half European prices at the moment. That is leaving the chemical industry, which had been moving out of America, to move back to America back from the Persian Gulf to the, Mex to the Gulf of Mexico because gas is its main feedstock. Gas as a source of electricity is, as we've heard, roughly one third cheaper than wind. At the moment, about half the price of nuclear, one quarter of the price of offshore wind, and one fifth of the price of solar. It is also scalable. That means you can just as efficiently generate electricity from gas on a small scale as on a large scale. That's remarkable. It's not true of coal or nuclear or other things. It means that you can build small facilities uh, and not have to put huge power lines between everybody and their gas supplies. Uh, and of course, because we use combined cycle uh, gas uh, turbines, um, you can get 60% efficiency of conversion of the thermal energy into electricity, uh, which is considerably higher than you can achieve with coal. But above all, it's not asking for and it's not needing any subsidy at all, unlike all the renewables uh, that, are, that have to come cap in hand to the hard-pressed electricity consumer. Gas can also replace oil in transport. This is already happening in various parts of the world where cheap gas is being used in urban transport, particularly for buses, because you need to be able to at first have it on a, a, a fixed route where, where the infrastructure is not too expensive to install. Um, running buses on gas, as happens in uh, New Delhi, um, uh, uh, Washington DC, Kuala Lumpur, a number of other capital cities, um, costs roughly one-third as much as running them on petrol and produces much less um, pollution. The environmental benefits of burning gas for electricity are considerable. Instead of coal, you produce virtually no sulfur, virtually no nitrogen oxides, no mercury, virtually no carbon monoxide, very little volatile organics, which leads to um, uh, urban smog and ozone. And of course, you don't slice eagles in half, uh, or have to depend upon um, neodymium imported from Inner Mongolia to make your magnets like the wind industry. Nor do you have to cut down rainforest uh, as you have to do if you're going to grow biofuels on a significant scale. Um, nor does gas need road transport or rail transport. It has fewer accidents than oil or, or, or coal. Uh, it kills fewer people in its production. Uh, and of course it doesn't spill into the ocean, which is another advantage. Um, the CO2 emissions for, from burning gas for electricity are 37% of what they are for coal. That's both because gas is four hydrogen atoms per carbon atom, whereas coal is about one to one, uh, and also because um, the combined cycle efficiency is higher than with coal. Now, you may have read that there's a professor at Cornell who says, nonetheless, gas is actually worse for the greenhouse effect because of the methane that leaks into the air in the production of gas. Um, the problem is that Professor Howarth has made three glaring errors which have been pointed out in the published literature. First of all, he forgot to count the methane that leaks out during coal mining. That makes a big difference. Secondly, he used an estimate of the greenhouse potential of methane that was four times higher than the one used by the IPCC. Uh, and thirdly, um, he... Uh, he used a figure for the amount of gas lost in the transmission of gas in pipelines in Russia as an estimate of leakage, whereas in fact it was an estimate of theft. Um, <laughs> so I, it's pretty clear to me that the only practical way 
to cut carbon dioxide emissions on any significant extent is also the cheapest way of getting energy, and that is to burn gas on a big scale. Um, to do it with biofuel uh, or wind is not going to get there. We're simply not going to get there. The, the European Environment Agency has actually uh, uh, now officially said that biofuels are not carbon neutral because of the land use effect. The fact that in order to grow biofuels, you either directly cut down forests uh, and release carbon from that or from the soils where they were growing, uh, or you put up the price of food so much that people go and cut down forests somewhere else, the so-called indirect land use changes. Um, it, if we were to use biofuels to power the entire world economy, and there are countries that do that. Haiti is one. It gets 70% of, uh, uh, of its energy from uh, burning wood, essentially, in the form, mostly in the form of charcoal. It is consequently 98% deforested. Um, uh, there are countries that do that. If we were to do that on a global scale, we would have to plant every square inch of Australia, China, India, and Brazil put together to grow enough biofuel to, to run the world economy. That's because biofuel can average only one half of a watt per square meter, according to figures that I've got from Vaclav Smil of the University of Manitoba. So, um, uh, if you want to destroy nature, go back to nature, um, essentially. Um, the environmental risks of gas, uh, shale gas, are real, but relatively minor. Uh, it's true that you can cause earthquakes by drilling for gas and fracturing rock. Uh, that's clear now. These earthquakes are micro-seismic events. They're about the equivalent of a lorry going past while you're sitting in bed. Um, this is true of other industries too. Uh, geothermal industry uh, has caused um, uh, small earthquakes and the, hyd the, the hydropower industry has caused significant earthquakes by building dams and loading faults with, with uh, extra weight. Um, now, it's true that the fracking fluid that is used to break open the rocks was kept a secret, and that encouraged a lot of people to get very excited about how toxic it was. Uh, we now know what's in fracking fluid. It's 99.86% water and sand. The other 0.14% is things at a very, very dilute level that you can find in a much more concentrated form under your kitchen sink, basically soap, disinfectant, and acid. Uh, in order to um, lubricate the, the, the water through the, the cracks in the rocks. Water, uh, groundwater contamination by this fluid is possible, uh, but only because of failure of the casing of the, of the vertical drill, not through the fissures made by fracking itself, because they are a mile beneath the aquifers uh, in places like Pennsylvania and would be here in the UK too. Uh, that water contamination is possible. There are still no cases certain cases where it's definitely happened, but it may well occasionally occur. Water contamination by gas leaking out of, of gas reserves it does happen. It happens naturally. The ones where you see taps being turned on and, and catching fire were not caused by fracking. They were biogenic gas from coal seams. Uh, it is not true to say that the uh, shale gas industry is unregulated in America. You'll hear that said. Simply not true. It's regulated at the state level, not at the federal level. That's what they mean by that. And uh, there is indeed a, an increase in the radioactivity of the water that comes back out of a fracking level, out of a, 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 a shale gas well. But the increase is so small as to be virtually undetectable and certainly not as great as you get from eating a banana. Um, and the final point about the environmental uh, aspects of uh, shale gas drilling uh, is people say, well, use up too much water. In Pennsylvania, uh, they're basically uh, about 1% of the total water consumption in the state is used for fracking, uh, even though it's got thousands and thousands of wells now. The political and economic effects of shale gas have to be seen to be believed. Uh, the increase in the standard of living in the parts of Pennsylvania where this is happening are tangible. 214,000 jobs have been created in that state alone, either in or tied to the gas industry. Um, renewables, on the other hand, as we've heard from Ruth, basically destroy jobs because you can't load a uh, quarter of a million pounds of extra costs onto the average SME and not expect them to lay off or fail to, to recruit people. Um, and as for energy security, uh, the idea that we would have to uh, 
um, that we could increase our energy security by getting our wind turbine uh, magnets from Inner Mongolia uh, or our um, uh, Drax power station uh, fuel from olive pits from Spain. Uh, these are not necessarily improving our energy security, whereas getting our own gas would. Uh, if we could, in Europe, uh, develop shale gas, we could tell Mr. Putin and Mr. Ahmadinejad where to go. Um, in America, the liquefied natural gas terminals that were built in the early 2000s, urged on by Alan Greenspan, saying that America badly needed to build these things um, because of its increasing dependence on imported gas, have all been either mothballed or turned into export terminals. That's how big an impact there's been. Uh, now, we haven't seen the impact on gas prices over here that we should have done because of all that Qatari gas that should be looking for markets. And the reason for that is simple, because we've had a year in which uh, supply was crimped by the Libyan war and demand was accelerated by the Japanese earthquake, because they cut down, shut down 20% of their electricity supply. They had to use an awful lot more gas. So when those two effects fade, as they will, uh, then you will indeed see an impact, even from American shale gas, on European prices. Now, Europe is different, it's true. Uh, the mineral rights to uh, hydrocarbons are nationalized in this country, uh, uh, so you can't go uh, and, and pay royalties to a farmer, but there's nothing to stop you paying compensation to a farmer. It's the same thing. That's what gas companies will do. It'll happen in just the same way. It's true that we lack the support industry for wildcat drilling that they have in America, and it will be hard to build that up because it is a highly sophisticated industry that's developed over a long time. Um, but, on the other hand, we're coming in quite high up the learning curve. We don't have to develop inefficient fracking techniques as the Americans had to do over the last 10 years because they have decreased the amount of time it takes to drill and frack a well in half over the last five years, so we can come in and get the technology at its most developed. So, in short, um, Mr. Hume, the Energy Secretary, says that it would be a mistake to make a dash for gas. Why then are we doing a dash for biomass? <laughs> we, are, we are building uh, so many biomass power stations at the moment that we will soon have a demand for wood that is 10 times what we could possibly produce at the maximum from within this country. Um, uh, and remember that 83% of our so-called renewable energy comes from burning things at the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, that is a most important analysis, I think, in terms of our future. And could I recommend to you the shale gas shock, which Matt wrote for the Global Warming Policy Foundation, and it's available on that table. Thank you very much indeed, Matt. And of course, the crucial word that occurred in that was energy security. Purely speaking as an academic for one moment, what I've seen is a fascinating change in language from the global warming rhetoric to two new phrases, food security and energy security. And they are going to be politically the governing language for the next 20 to 30 years. And we have in this country to make sure we follow that language and not stick with the old position. Very important indeed. And what Matt was saying there about the possibilities in this country of providing energy security, it would be immoral, in my opinion, for us now to fail to take those up as quickly as possible. And we simply cannot allow the politicians to fail on this particular issue for the future. So thank you to my speakers for keeping to time. That was absolutely, well, all of them were just 15 minutes long. That's wonderful. Thank you so much indeed. And also for one other thing, and I think it's very interesting. Often those of who are talked about as being sceptical of the whole agenda on this are accused of ourselves using emotive language and all that. Have you noticed how each one of these speakers was absolutely grounded in statistics, facts, and evidence, marshaled to make a case? including Donna's splendid analysis based on the actual evidence rather than just statements about the IPCC. I think this is very important. And we just should remember the dangers of the isolation that we're coming. Canada may now be the first country to break ranks and to leave the Kyoto Protocol. Canada announced that it is likely to leave the Kyoto Protocol for the very reason that the energy potentials that they have in either uh, December or January the first to break rights. In many ways, of course, the US, even under President Obama, has also done so in, a, in de facto terms. This is going to leave Europe yet again high and dry and an immensely dangerous political position.
But thank you very much indeed.